Okay, just doing a sound and video check. We should be live on on YouTube now. Can someone give me a hands up in the questions lectures channel that all's good? Thanks, Jacob. And just checking that you can see the, the title screen for Monday week nine. Wonderful, thanks very much. Okay, I make it nine o'clock. I'll just switch off for five minutes and um, the lecture will start at five past nine. See you then.
Okay, five past nine, let's, uh, let's get underway. Uh, let me know in the questions lectures channel if there's any problems with the audio or video, Sarah should be monitoring Q&A. Um, let me know if any problems. Okay, so what I wanted to do today is uh, continue and review last Thursday's lecture. Now, you'll probably recall from Thursday that I had a commitment late in the afternoon that meant I pre-recorded Thursday's lecture. Um, what I'd like to do is review some of that content this morning. So we'll move reasonably quickly, but we'll um, cover some of the ground that we did on Thursday. So the first few slides of, of today, you will recognize if you have followed Thursday's lecture, you'll recognize those, those slides from, from last Thursday's lecture. And I want to do that for a couple of reasons. One is because we, we introduced a topic on Thursday, um, integration, in particular, numerical integration. I'll explain what that means in just a moment. We covered numerical integration, and um, I'm conscious it's a very useful topic, and I wouldn't want you to think that we covered it in one hour and that was all we needed to, to use it for, because numerical integration throughout all branches of engineering is a really... Um, it's a, an operation that's not only very useful for engineering applications, but it's ideally suited for, um, for, for computation. Uh, and then I wanna look at a couple of applications. And as I said, as I mentioned on Thursday, there are many applications of, uh, of integration in, in engineering. Um, some of which, many of which actually require a bit more maths and physics than, than I can assume uh, knowledge of for the students in this class. So we're going to pick just a couple of applications today. And along the way, as well as seeing those applications, as well as seeing numerical integration in action, I'm going to introduce to you a few, uh, a few language features from Python. Actually, there are a few, a couple of little um, function calls from, from, different, from different libraries, from different modules. Um, because I think they're powerful and they allow you to, to do interesting things that you might want to integrate into, into, into your future work. So we'll, to some extent, today's lecture will be, at, I'm going to say, a fairly relaxed pace. Part of its review, part of its applications, which get you to see the content we saw in last week's lecture in action. We'll pick up a couple of Python language features along the way and um, we'll probably take maybe an hour or, or, or maybe a little longer today. The lecture won't go for the full two hours. And the second reason I want to do that is because I, I like where, wherever possible to ease off on, on a whole lot of new content in a week in which you have an assessed lab. And being week nine, um, assessed lab number two will take place this week. So I'm deliberately leaving a little bit of mental space for you in a week where you've got an assessed lab in this course to just back off on the new content somewhat. So that just a reminder that the assessed lab number two will run in this week's face-to-face -face lab sessions. Um, there is a practice version of the assessed lab in Blackboard week eight course content. And there's quite a lot of good discussion going on in the questions labs channel in Discord that um, will let you get your head around what you need to do or the sorts of activities that you're likely to be asked in, the, in this week's Assess Lab. Uh, for online students, uh, well, so for all the class, there won't be any Zoom um, labs this week, except the two, uh, the, the, there's a number of uh, Zoom labs which run um, back to back, which make a two hour Zoom. And we're gonna use those two hour Zooms for the online students. So if you're a student for the, for the overwhelming majority of students in this class, there will be no Zoom labs this week. Okay, so um, I'll, I'll give you that verbally here, but I'll make an announcement on Blackboard once the lecture's done. Okay, let's kick off with the content. So I said the, the lecture overview really falls into two, into two chunks. One is a review. And so for the first half a dozen slides or so, they will literally be um, re-presentations of content that 
we saw in last Thursday's lecture. And I want to do that for the students who, who didn't manage to catch the pre-recorded lecture. Uh, I, want, I want to make sure that everyone's seen it. For those of you that have seen it, it'll be something of a review. And then I'm going to look at two applications of integration. Um, we're going to use that integration to compute the average value of a function. And we're going to use integration to compute the area between two curves. And both these have applications in, in, in engineering. So just a review of what we mean by integration. At the top of this slide three, you'll see a function fx and uh, an area, a shaded area s. And that shaded area, the gray shaded area represents the area under the curve f between the limits a and b. And a and b are called the, up, the lower and upper limits of, uh, of integration. And so really when I, when I think of integration, I really think it's almost synonymous with, with area. So whenever I wanna compute an area, I compute, um, I, I need to perform the, the process of integration. And that's written mathematically in this, the, the boxed equation that you see in the middle of, this, of the slide here, where I've got S, that is the area, is equal to the integral written as this squiggly, the, the long, the long um, integration symbol from lower limit A to upper limit B of this function F of X. And uh, mathematically, this, that's, this is known as the definite integral of F over the range A, B. There's something called an, in, an indefinite integral, and um, we don't need to know about that in this course. Um, uh, so it's the definite integral that we're interested in computing. Now, for some choices of F, it's possible to use the tools of calculus to compute that integral exactly. And many of you will have seen it, um, uh, perhaps at high school, depending on what level of mathematics you did. Some of you will be look, seeing, looking at integration in Math 1002, and some of you will be uh, looking at integration in Math 1110. Um, I can't assume all of you have seen integration before, but even so, even if you have seen integration before, uh, there's only a relatively small number of choices of the function f for which it's possible to come up with pen and paper or so-called closed form expressions for the, for the integral of, of f. Um, and so the numerical lesson, methods that, that, that were presented in last Thursday's lecture, and one of which I present, I represent in, in, in a couple of slides, they're possible to apply in cases when f is difficult to integrate, or in some cases impossible to integrate, mathematically impossible to integrate. So what that means is that in about 10 lines of code, you can accurately integrate almost any function that occurs in an engineering application, even if calculus, the tools of calculus don't apply. So this is really a, a very powerful tool that I'm that, that we're that we're covering here in these in these lectures. Now there's a technical condition at the bottom of this slide that the function f is got to be positive, namely that the function exists in the upper half of the plane. Um, that's not a that's not a math, that's not a very restrictive assumption. If the f that we're interested in integrating was below the, the horizontal axis, we could just create a new function, which was the mirror image and, and integrate that. So for all practical purposes, that assumption is not important. Now, what you will see, just a little look ahead for what's coming later in the lecture, you will see that that area S is the area that exists above the X axis and up to the function f. That's a limitation or that's a definition of what the integral of, of s of f means. Um, we would, in some cases, like to compute the area of a less regularly shaped um, area, <laughs> uh, region, in which case we need a little extension and I'm gonna show you what that extension is today. Good, so that's what integration is. Think of an integration as area, um, and think of the, and, and, and this expression here, which captures the, the, the integration of the function f between the lower and upper limits a and b, where b's greater than a. So here's an example. This is the example that we saw in uh, last Thursday's lecture. 
And suppose we have a, a, a V in the last week's lecture, the application made clear that V was a speed, a speed starting from zero and quickly accelerating up so that after one unit on the horizontal axis, think of it as one second, the speed was up to a little bit over eight, something like eight meters per second. If we have a plot of speed versus time, then the area under that curve is the distance that's traveled up to that point in time. So for example, the cross hatched area that you see on, on the slide there now, the cross hatched area represents the distance traveled over the time starting at zero up to time one, if the speed curve is this, is this, is this, this uh, rapidly increasing speed curve here. And we write that as the integral between zero time zero and one time one of the speed V of T, and we write it in this, in this way. So what we're interested in doing is computing the area under that curve. Now that might appear quite challenging because this, this is a, there's no, um, how would you go about computing the area under a, under a, under a curve? Well, in this particular case, this VT has been chosen, um, and we looked at some of the details in last week's, in last Thursday's lecture, the VT has been chosen in such a way that it's possible to integrate that expression exactly. But let's just pretend for the moment that we don't have that capability. There are two methods, two basic methods I presented on Thursday last, in which we can approximate the area using numerical methods. So we sort of put aside the, the techniques of calculus and we just use um, numerical methods to compute that area. I presented two methods, one of which is called the trapezoidal method. I'm gonna apply that today in, um, several times. And there was a second method called Simpson's method. I'm not gonna to touch on Simpson's method today. It's important. We'll probably follow up on, on some, assist, on some um, lab sheets next week just think about what's called this trapezoidal method. And the trapezoidal method approximates the area under a curve by breaking the horizontal axis up into, into segments or panels, and then choosing a trapezoid that approximates the shape of the curve, and then adding up the area of each trapezoid. So these trapezoids are, are four-sided four figures, um, and, the, and you can sort of see the basic shape of the trapezoids that we need to deal with here. They're sort of like a, um, they're, they're flat at the bottom in this case, they've got vertical sides, that's important, parallel sides, and then they've got a, an, a possibly angled um, top edge. Now the area of each trapezoid is easy to calculate. And if we can calculate the area of the four trapezoids, there are actually four here, one of them's blue, one of them's red, one of them's green. That's three, they're easily seen. There is actually a trapezoid right down here between um, on the, the panel that spans the width zero to 0.2. It's, it's really small because the, the V of T takes small values at that point, but trust me, there are actually four trapezoids here. And I've used the color coding here, black, green, red, and blue to map to the black, green, red, and blue trapezoids on the slide. And I said that the area of each trapezoid is easy to calculate in the following way. The area of the trapezoids that are, that are presented in, in numerical integration, uh, the area of that trapezoid is exactly, no approximation, the width of the trapezoid times the average of the two um, vertical heights. Okay, pretty easy to, to use some geometry to, to, to establish that fact. Now there's no approximation in that area of the trapezoid. Where the approximation comes in is if you look here, where you see the, the, the four colored trapezoids that are approximating the, the function. If you look, you can see that the curve of the function sweeping up here. The approximation comes in from the fact that, for example, over, over the time period 0.8 to one, the function is only being approximated by the, by the straight edge of the trapezoid. There's a, there's an, the area of this little wedge here that fits between the, the straight edge of the trapezoid and the curve of the function, that's where the approximation comes in. But if we choose not four panels, but a hundred panels, that approximation area gets smaller and smaller. And so we'll 
uh, today we'll use uh, the trapezoidal method to approximate the area underneath um, a, a number of several functions. And we'll do it with large numbers of panels in such a way that the approximation error is really small. So there's the area of trapezoid, base width times the average of the two heights. So there's a property of integrals, which says that if we integrating between, for example, zero and one, that's equal to the sum of the integrals over, over the over the sub intervals. So there's no approximation here. This basically says that the area under a curve between zero and one, the area under that curve is equal to the area under each of four sub intervals of that curve, provided those sub intervals uh, sit up adjacent to each other and cover the same cover the same range. So for example, if we're integrating between zero and one, we can break that interval up from zero to 0 0.2, 0 0.2 to 0 0.6, 0 0.6 to 0.8, and 0.8 to one. And so those, those regions sit up against each other. And if you put them all together, they make the original domain of integration. Here's where the approximation comes in. Again, color coding, black, green, red, and blue corresponding to these trapezoids that approximate the curve. And for example, if we focus on the, the blue, uh, the blue zone, the area under this blue trapezoid is H4, which is the width of this, the blue panel, times the average of, of the vertical uh, heights of the, of, the, of the blue trapezoid. And we deliberately choose the, the vertices of the trapezoid to match the function at the endpoints of the subinterval. So V of 0.8 is the height of this blue trapezoid at that vertex at time 0.8. And V at one is the height of the blue trapezoid where we match the function value V at time interval one. So the first expression here is an equality. The second is an approximation written expressed by this, this squiggle, the double squiggle lines, because we're approximating the areas under each of those uh, curves by their trapezoidal equivalents. And the, the H's with subscripts are the widths of the panels, black, green, red, and blue. And this, is, this, situ, this, this example here is, a little, is quite unusual in that the panel widths are unequal. 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.2, 0 0.2. Normally, 99% of the time with numerical integration, the panel widths are, are equal. And so the general trapezoidal method is to approximate an integral between A and B by N trapezoids of equal width. Here they are written as adjacent subintervals. It's like a chain. The upper edge of the first subinterval, the upper point of the first subinterval becomes the lower edge of the of the second, the second and the third, and so on up to the up to the top. And I've used color coding here to represent the, the lower limit of integration is A. So X0 is equal to A, and the upper limit is equal to B. So we're, we're sort of spanning the domain, the, the range, and um, we're, we're covering it. And so here's the general rule. Um, this, is a, this is a particular form of the uh, the, the general form of what we saw here on, on slide eight, where we used a particular choice of, um, of, of panel widths and a particular function that we're integrating V. And if we write out what the area of those trapezoids is and then do a little bit of manipulation, we find that in, uh, we have a very a lovely compact form for the trapezoidal method, which says that the, the integration of F between limits A and B is approximately equal to the panel width times half the function value at the lower end point plus half the function value at the upper end point plus, and in the curly parentheses here, the sum of the function values at all the intermediate um, edges of the, the, of the trapezoids. And it's this function this expression here, the compact form in the black squared that we implement in Python. And again, we saw this, this code is exactly 
um, code that was run live for you last Thursday. And this Python code, trapezoidalmethod.py, is available in the Blackboard lecture content for week eight. And so let's look at it here. We've got 19 lines of code. There's a commentary in last week's lecture, but let me pick out the main points for you. In order to apply the trapezoidal method, we need to define this function here in line six to 12, which implements the trapezoidal method for, a, for an arbitrary choice of F. And so you can see here that most of the work's being done in the for loop and the return statement picks up panel width times half the function value at the lower end of integration, plus half the function value at the upper edge of integration, plus a sum that's computed f, f underscore sum, which is computed in a in this in this for loop. And that the for loop in lines nine, 10 and 11 is exactly implementing this expression in the, the, the curly parentheses in the middle of the boxed equation here. So we've seen this before. This is code we saw last, last Thursday. That's the trapezoidal method in defined as a function in lines six to 12. And what we do in lines in three and four is compute the function value itself that we're that we're that we're um, that we're integrating. So in this case, it's three t squared times the exponential of t cubed. So in line four, the highlighted expression here, three t squared e to the t cubed. That is exactly this expression that you see here on page five. Three t squared e to the t cubed. And there it is in, um, in so this, this code here, trapezoidalmethod.py um, has two function definitions, the function we want to integrate, a general trapezoidal integration method, and the rest of the code is really just a call to um, that trapezoidal integration approximation um, with four panels and then printing, the, printing the, the results. I won't run this one live because I ran it for you live last Thursday. So far, so good. Recap. First 10 slides of today is a recap and a replay of last Thursday's lecture. From here on in, we apply that knowledge to a couple of different, in a couple of different settings. And the first of those is to, is to use integration to compute the average value of a function. And so the average value of a function, also called the mean, they mean exactly the same thing. The mean value of a function f on an interval is defined as the integration of that function over the limits a to b. So that's, that's where the numerical integration comes in. Scaled by one on the difference between the upper and lower limits of integration. So this works for an arbitrary function f, provided it's, um, no, if it, it, works, it actually works for an arbitrary value of f. And we write that mean value, it's very common to express the mean value with a, a bar over the top. So uh, f bar is, is read as the mean value of f or mean of f or mean f, something like that. But there's, there's various names for it. Think of it as the average value. It's the average value of f over, over the interval a to b. So you can see very clearly how the how integration plays a key role in defining this mean value. It's the integral of, of f over the range a to b scaled by one on the upper limit minus the lower limit of integration. So here's an application. Application. We're going to compute the average value of a function and to give it some practical engineering relevance. We're going to assume that we model the daily temperature of the outside air as given by this expression. So this is the, the function that we're going to integrate. Um, 20 minus 5 times the cosine of uh, pi times the time t, divide, scaled by 12. Where time is measured in hours, so t is for time. And uppercase t is measured in degrees Celsius. And so that expression there, um, T of uppercase T of time is 20 minus five cosine of pi T on 12. It'd be good to see what that looks like. 
does it, does it, do the values look reasonable? So the first of our tasks is to plot the value of t over the course of one, one day. So where time t in hours ranges from zero up to 24. And then we're going to use numerical integration to find the average temperature between the hours of 6 a.m. and 12 p.m. noon. And so expressions like this, they're very simple. Um, daily temperature, you might use an expression like this if you were um, modeling the behavior of an energy system, for example, and you wanted to know how uh, individuals responded with air conditioners, for example, did they turn, um, if you wanted to model thousands of uh, consumers all living in houses where their temperature, daily temperature range was modeled by this expression involving the cosine function. And then you could use a, a, a simplified expression like that to, uh, to capture the behavior of the, the temperature at, at individuals' households, maybe different households experience different different temperatures. So that's there's an engineering motivation for it. Yes, it's a simple equation, but uh, you'll see that it actually it's a it's a reasonable starting point for um for modeling for modeling temperature. So what I'm going to do for you is show you what the results look like, and then we're going to generate them live with Python code that's been posted in um, Discord and also on Blackboard. So what I want to do at the moment is just focus on the blue line. The blue line is the temperature function. So you can see the time range is from zero to 24. So over the course of one day, the blue line is exactly this expression here that I'm about to highlight on page. Let's see if I can highlight it. And easily highlight for me. Okay, this expression, uh, uppercase T of time, uh, is represented by this blue line. Does that make sense? 20 minus 5 cosine pi T on 12. These numbers 25 and 12 have been chosen in such a way that the temperature variation is scaled so that at midnight, at zero hours, the temperature is 15 degrees. It then rises steadily up until noon. It peaks here at noon at about at, at 25 degrees Celsius. And then the temperature drops back down steadily from noon through the afternoon and into the evening and up to midnight of the next night um, so that it, it's, it's 15 degrees. So clearly it's a simplified uh, modeling of, of temperature variation, but it's a useful starting point. So that's the blue line. Now the red area is the integral between time six and time 12 of the function uppercase T of time. And I'm gonna show you in the Python code how to plot this red area. I didn't show you that last week and I'm gonna show you, give you the code and step you through how to do that, how to do that now. So the red area is the integral of of the, of the time, the temperature variation between the hours of 6 a.m. and 12 noon. Now, the average temperature is not the integral, but it's related to that integral. In fact, the average temperature, if you remember the definition of the average, the average is of a function over a particular interval is defined by its integral over that interval scaled by one on the difference between the upper and lower limits of integration. So if we apply that here, we get that the average temperature over the range 6 a.m. to 12 noon is the integral of the temperature variation between 6 and 12. Think of it as the area under the T, the temperature curve, scaled by one on the upper limit of integration minus the lower limit. And if we pop those numbers into that approximation, and I'm going to show you the code that computes the uh, that approximates the area of this of this red shaded zone um, is it works out to about, about 23.18 degrees Celsius. So that sort of makes sense because you can see at 6 a.m. the temperature is about 20 degrees. At 12 noon, it's, a, it's 25 degrees. The average value would have to fit somewhere in the range 20 to 25. 
and it's in this case it's 23.18 computed to two, two decimal places. A temperature is normally accurate. You'd normally measure it to one or two decimal places and no more. So there we go. That's what the, the numbers pop out, but let's look at the code. I'm gonna present the code to you in two chunks. It's actually one script and we're gonna run the script live. Um, I wanna point out the two pieces of the code for you and then we'll, but they're actually part of, of uh, one, one block of code. Uh, it, the, the, the code is, exact, is called computeaverage.py. And again, it's available for you in the lecture code channel on Discord, but it's also been posted in the week nine course materials in Blackboard. Now, if you look at this code that you see here in front of you, it's almost identical to the trapezoidal method code that we saw Thursday of week of last week, but also presented for you in, in slides earlier today. Look at the look at the basic structure of it. In lines eight through 14, we've got the trapezoidal approximation method. It's exactly the same as it was um, in their trapezoidal method um, Python code, no change needed. That's the beauty of getting this sort of code right. You get it right and you can apply it in multiple places. I probably should put this in a library and then import the library. I haven't done that. I've just included the code directly for you. So you're not worried about things being being hidden away, I want you to see the details here. But if I was actually writing a larger program, I would uh, write, debug, test, verify that the trapezoidal method code was working, and then I'd put it in a module and import that module in, in full confidence that the code would run um, when it was needed. Okay, so lines eight through 14, trapezoidal method. Lines five and six are a function which represents the mathematical function to be integrated. And here it is, uh, we return 20 minus five times the cosine of pi times t on 12. And sure enough, that's the value of, that's this expression here, this highlighted expression. 20 minus five times the cosine of pi t on 12. So the only thing that needs to change when we're using numerical integration um, methods, the only thing that needs to change is the definition of the function to be integrated. Um, that's quite unlike applying the tools of calculus where there might be tricks and methods that are adapted to particular choices of the function, not so um, with numerical integration. And we've got access to the NumPy and Matplotlib libraries. That code you've pretty much seen before. Um, this is the second chunk of the same code and we're gonna run the whole thing in just a moment. And I wanna draw your attention to two major pieces of uh, that, that are going on in this second half of the code. In lines one through five here, what we do is compute and then display on the, on the console the trapezoidal approximation to the integral between limits of integration A and B, where A and B are time points six and 12, six a and 12 noon. So here's the function call, trapezoidal function T, limits of integration A and B, and n is the number of panels and the number of sub intervals that we're going to integrate the function over. Um, so we're actually get, we're not going to use the, the example I showed earlier today had four panels, four trapezoids approximating the function. This time we're going to use a thousand so that we would hope that the, the approximation error is very small. But notice in line four, we compute the trap, we, we compute the integral and that's the shaded bit of code that I've got there. And then we scale it by dividing it by B minus A. Why do we do that? Because we're computing the average temperature. And remember the average is scaled by um, dividing the integral by the difference between the upper and lower limits of integration. 
And so here it is, we compute T average as the integral or an approximation to the integral over the limits A to B scaled by um, the upper minus the lower limits of integration. Okay, so far so good. And if we were to run that code, what we would see on the console is the value, what did I say it was? 23.18, we'll do it live in just a moment. Okay, but now what I wanna do is introduce a new, uh, a new function call to you. It comes, it's a function that's available inside the uh, matplotlib library. And it's a function. So if you look what's going on in here, I define it. Um, I wanted to plot the blue line over time zero to 24 using a thousand time points. And I use the lin space. We saw that right back at the start of the course. We use lin space to, to linearly space time points between um, time zero and time 24. And I need in line seven, I create a time base that allows me to plot the blue curve. Nice blue curve. But now what I wanna do, this is the new bit. So what I'm, so far you've seen, everything you've seen has been code you've seen before or small adaptations of code you've seen before. This is the new bit. In line eight, we define a new time base which runs over time six hours to 12 noon. Again, using a thousand points. The choice of time here is not particularly important. I could have chosen a hundred, I could have chosen 20. It's not necessarily matched to this, this a thousand. I just chose a thousand to be done with it. Okay. And I've called that variable T6112, meaning time six to time 12. And here's the new bit of code. A call to something called fill between. And fill between means that it'll, uh, if we pass in a time base and the function evaluations on that time base, the fill between function actually fills in the area underneath the function that we've specified here. So this is a time, this is a function values over those times. And then the fill between function inside the matplotlib library will actually fill in the area under. So it's line 10 that does this nice shading of the, the, the area underneath the blue line and above the horizontal axis. And just to make things look nice, I've controlled the color of that, of that, uh, of that, of that fill region. I think by default it's blue. We'll try that in a moment. And then again, to make things look nice, I've used something, that, a parameter for the fill between function called alpha. And alpha is the um, is, is, a, is a transparency control. So I'm basically, you can, if you look here, you'll see it's, it's sort of like, a, it's half transparent. Um, and so, and then, and then the rest is just plotting. So let's run that code now. Let's run, what's it called? Compute average. We're gonna break out and run compute average in PyCharm. So here's compute average, first half of the code, function to be integrated, trapezoidal method, second half of the code, use a thousand panels to approximate the trapezoidal at the integral using the trapezoidal method, and then use this, uh, not only plot the function itself, but plot the area underneath it using these color and transparency controls. So let's run that now. I'm gonna run, compute average. And there we go. Um, we, get, we get on the console, we get that the average temperature is 23.8 degrees. And we get this lovely plot that plots not only the blue curve, but the area underneath the blue curve using the, using the, um, using this uh, plot fill between control.
how will we experiment with that? Um, let's change the number of panels to 10. It still gives a, an average temperature of 23. That's interesting. Gives the same answer. I didn't expect that. I thought it might have been. There we go. Twenty. If we if we only use five panels, we get twenty three point one six. If we only use, let's go really rough, <laughs> um, two panels, rerun it again. We're going to get a number that's a bit different now. The reason why the the number of panels in this case is uh, the, the, the number that's computed as the, the average temperature, really meaning the, the integral over the time six to 12. The reason why the number of panels is not critical is because the function F is really well behaved. It's very smooth. It's almost like a straight line. Yes, it's a bit curved, but it's not very curved. If the function wiggled around a lot between times five, between 6 a.m. and 12 uh, noon, what we would need to do is use a large number of panels. In this case, it, it really doesn't matter too much. Um, that's, that's probably all I want to do in demonstrating that. Let's run it again. And we'll return it to its original form and we're done. Good. So that's really nice. That's, uh, what we've done there is a couple of things. We've used numerical integration to compute the average of a function by computing its integral and then dividing by the width of the panel. And then the second thing we've done is introduce the use of this fill between um, function inside the matplotlib library that allows us to plot um, these areas underneath curves. I'm actually gonna show you an extension of that same fill between function in the next application. Good. So we've looked at our first application and we've we computed the average. The second application I wanna run through with you today is to compute the area between curves. So far, we've looked at the area underneath one curve, but now we wanna get a little bit more sophisticated and look at the area between curves. And I've got a, a generic example for you on the screen there now. Suppose we want to compute the area A that's shaded in blue there. And it's the area is defined by a couple of different um, parameters. We need to know the width of the integration. Notice how the, the sides of those of this area A are, are, are vertical. That's because we're integrating over a range A to B. And we're going to integrate not just one, but this time two functions. And the area between F and G is written in the form of, in, in mathematical form, as being the integral of the difference between the F and G functions over the range A and over the range A to B. I would prefer to think of that area as being the area under the F curve minus the area under the G curve. And I'll show you, I'm going to try and use colors to illustrate what I mean by that with a very particular example. But in general, the general application of integration and numerical integration to compute the area between curves rather than just under one curve, the expression is the one that you see on slide 16. Let me see if I can use colors to illustrate what I mean by that. I've got two functions here. One represented by a red curve. And I want you to focus on just the upper panel at the moment. The red curve is defined by this function f, which is the square root of x. And the square root function looks like this red curve at the on, 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 the, on, the, on the top panel. And the blue curve, also on the top panel, is the function x cubed. Now, these two functions have been chosen for 
to illustrate this uh, application of numerical integration to compute the area between curves. And they've been chosen in such a way that those two curves, the red curve and the blue curve, they intersect at two points. They intersect at zero, zero, coordinates zero, zero. And they also intersect at the point one, one. And so they've been chosen just for the sake of illustration um, to create this sort of a, I don't know if you want to call it a gum leaf uh, shape, and it's the area in green. So up until now, the methods that we've presented up until this point don't enable us to compute that area because it's not the area under a curve, but it is the area between two curves. And it's the area between the red curve, square root of X, and the blue curve, X cubed. And what, let me just back up one slide. What the equation at the bottom of page 16 says, look at the right-hand side of that equation. It says the area A between the curves F and G is the area under F minus the area under G. What that's saying is that the green area is equal to the red area in the middle panel minus the blue area in the bottom panel. Now, again, the colors are being used very deliberately here. The red shaded area is the area under the red curve. The blue shaded area is the area under the blue curve. And you can sort of do a, a visual subtraction. The green area is equal to the red area minus the blue area. So the green area is equal to the whole area under the red curve minus the area under the lower or blue curve. So if visually what's going on here is what's going on mathematically on slide 16. The area between two curves is the area between the upper curve subtracted away, um, subtract away the area under the under the bottom curve. And so the, the, the green region, namely the area between the curves F and G, is the area under the under the red, or the area, the red area, red region, the area of the red region minus the area of the blue region. So that's what's going on mathematically. That's what's going on visually. Let's present the numbers and then run the Python code that actually, um, that actually verifies those numbers for us. And we're gonna use the Python code in um, called area between curves. And I've, I've, I've posted that for you in, in Blackboard and, um, and Discord. And we're going to use the trapezoidal method could use Simpson's method, but I'm going to use trapezoidal method again. And we're going to divide this area up into a thousand sub intervals. So um, very narrow slices. And because neither of these functions, F or G, changes very quickly, they both change quite smoothly. If we divide the horizontal range up into a thousand sub intervals, then we'd be confident of getting a, an accurate answer. And so, again, I've used colors here very deliberately. The integral between zero and one of square root of x dx is actually this area of the, of, of the integral between a and b of f. a being zero, b being one, and f being the upper function, which was square root of x. So the, the green shaded area is equal to the integral between zero and one of the function f in red. Hence, we typeset it in red mathematics, red numbers, minus the area in blue, which is the integral between zero and one of x cubed, this blue shaded area. And, and that's an equality. The first equation that you see right in the middle of that slide, that's an equality. The area, the green area is equal to the red area minus the blue area. Where this approximation comes in is that we're going to use the trapezoidal method to approximate those areas using a thousand sub, sub intervals that are adjacent to one another and span the range zero to one. And so the numbers that you see there in red 
are what come out of the area between curves Python script. And the difference between them is this number in green, 0.41666. Now in this case, there's an exact answer available. If you know a little bit of calculus and you want to see how that exact answer was computed, I've put a link there for you at the bottom of the slide. Beyond the scope of this course, don't expect you to know that. Um, in good time, you'll know it through calculus if and when you take those calculus courses. Only point you need to know here now is that an exact answer exists. And in this case, it's equal to five on 12, point, which is equal to 0.416 repeater. So to, to six decimal places, it's 0.416667. Exact answer exists for this course, I'm not interested where that number comes from. But what we can see is that our numerical approximation is very accurate. It's accurate to within five decimal places um, by choosing um, a large number of sub intervals. So we've seen how to compute the area between curves in mathematics. We've seen it visually. We know the numbers for this particular example. I'm gonna present some Python code now for you um, that, uh, that, that, that computes these numbers and we'll, we'll have an, a live experiment with, the, with, the, with a couple of the parameters and see what the impact is. Again, the structure of this code is fairly similar to code we've seen before. In lines 10 through 16, trapezoidal method approximation, no change to code you've seen before, literally a cut and paste. I should put it in a library. I haven't. I want you to see the details. Lines four through to eight define the two functions that we're interested in computing the area between. Function f is the square root of x. Function g returns x cubed. And so you've seen those um, in this example here, the area between these curves, square root of x and x cubed. Here it is in Python code in lines four through to eight. Down the bottom of this first half of the code, again, the code's so big it needs to split across two, two slides. Uh, down the bottom, we compute using a thousand panels on a, uh, actually you can ignore line 19 for a moment. It, it, it gets used in the second half of the code. So we use a thousand panels and we compute two approximations to integrals. The first one is we approximate the integral of f between the limits of zero and one using a thousand sub, sub intervals. That gives us the area under the red, under the red curve. And I've called it, I've called the variable under f. And likewise in line 21, we compute an approximation to the area under the function g between limits zero and one using the um, approximation, tra trapezoidal approximation. And in line 22, this is where the, the action happens. We compute the area between two curves as being the area under f minus the area under g. And it's that line, line 22 of the code corresponds to the mathematical expressions that you see in red and blue on this slide 19. Uh, I think I've pretty much summarized that. You've got the Python code commentary there for future reference. Nothing there I haven't said, skip over it. Here's the Python code for uh, displaying the results. We, in, in lines one through four, we simply print some uh, either the the results to the to the console. You'll see that when I run it live. In lines nine, thirteen, and seventeen, you'll see again a call to fill between, and that's the function in Matplotlib library that we introduced um, earlier this morning. But I'm using it in a different way. 
and I'll talk about the details of how we do that shortly. But you'll see in 9, 13, and 17, three successive calls to fill between. Now, notice the colours. In line 9, we use colour green. That's the sort of the gum leaf shaped zone. The second call to fill between, we use colour red. That's to, that's to colour this region here in the, the second panel. And the third call to fill between uses colour blue to represent this area under the blue, under the blue curve. So lines 9, 13 and 17 plot three regions in three graphs. Now, uh, you may have seen this before. I can't recall if Sarah introduced this before or I can't rec recall if I've seen it in, um, in, in Discord chat, but I definitely want you to be able to, to use this function. It's a nice feature of uh, matplotlib. Notice one thing that I passed over in silence here was that we've got one figure that's got three separate plots in it. And I can't be certain whether I've shown you how to, or, or whether Sarah's shown you how to do this before. Um, if it's a bit of revision, fine. If you haven't seen it before, uh, it's a useful feature. We've got three plots. They're separate, they're distinct, but they all occur on the one on the one figure. And we, used, we do that using um, a call to the subplot function inside matplotlib. And then we pass in three parameters. The first two parameters say that there are three, there are three uh, uh, plots that we want to display. So it's like a column of three plots with one, sorry, one column, and then in the second one with three plots in it. And the third number is an index. So you'll see in line six, the index is one. In line 10, the index is two. In line 14, the index is three. That corresponds to the top, middle, and bottom plot in a stack of three by one figures all in the same plot. So let's run, and, and here's some commentary for, your, for future reference. Let's run that code now. What's it called? Area between curves. Here's area between curves. Again, trapezoidal function highlighted in blue. Definition of functions F and G highlighted in blue. We then compute the area of the green leaf shaped area by computing the total area under F and subtracting off it the area under G. And then we've got this long string of, of code that is used to display those three functions. There was a great question on Discord uh, before the mid-semester break about um, seeing a whole lot of chunked up code that like you see there highlighted in blue. Um, it sometimes feels like uh, calls to plotting functions are quite, uh, they're, they're quite repetitive. Um, and a little bit inefficient to type. That is true. And to some extent, there's no real way around that. There would be ways of writing this code that are slightly more efficient, but that also be a little harder to, to understand and, and modify. So I've just kept this presentation here simple. What that means is that it's sometimes possible, and this is, I'm just gonna step back and talk more generally about Python code. It's sometimes possible to have, in this case, what it's about, 10 lines of code that produce three plots and produce them in a certain particular fine-tuned way. And yet, this, and yet in less than 10 lines of code, we actually implement quite a sophisticated numerical integration algorithm. That's, that's, that's a common feature of programming. Sometimes you've got code that really you want to just pick up, copy, paste, make small modifications to. Other times, you might spend an hour, a day, a week, a month fine tuning 10 lines of code that, that um, implement a very sophisticated algorithm. So there's nothing 
another way of saying what I've just said is there's nothing wrong with having big chunks of code like that um, that, that, that do plotting. Really, there's no, there's no, there's, there's not really a simpler way of doing it. So let's run that code now. I'm gonna run area between curves. And there you see, you see the plots them, the plots themselves, three of them. Let's put them side by side with the, with the code that generates them. In the top subplot, we plot F in red, G in blue. That's what this code does. Now my plot's disappeared. Let me run it again. In the second subplot, again, we produce F in red, G in blue. Oh, I should back up. Let me look at the, in line 32 of the code, you'll see that there's a, a plot fill command with um, X, FX and GX. That's the command to, to Python to fill the areas between the curves F and G. So this is really, this is really an extension of the call to plot fill between that we, that we saw earlier. The earlier plot fill between when we were computing the average computed the area, a region underneath the curve. This call to fill between actually fills in between two, two curves. So if we pass in X, the function value F evaluated at X and the function G evaluated it also at X, then the fill between with color green produces this gum leaf plot, which is really quite um, an elegant um, call. It's an elegant feature of the fill between function, I should say, it's not an elegant bit of my code. It's the, it's a very elegant implementation of fill between. Um, and then in the, in the, in the bottom half of the code, you see the, the two subsequent calls in the, the lower two subplots, which plot the area underneath the function F and the area underneath the function, the function G. And what we see on the console is that the area under F is 0.6 repeater, the area under G is 0.25. So the area between F and G with a thousand sub intervals, thousand panels is equal to this 0.4166. And we know that the exact area is 0.416667. So what happens now if we experiment and we drop down the number of panels to, to five, run that code again, we'll see no change in the plots, but we'll see that on the console, the area between F and G is being computed to much less accuracy. That's not surprising because we're only using five sub intervals. If we bump it up to 50 and run it again, we'll get an answer closer to the 0.416667. Bump it up again to 500 sub intervals. And we're, we're basically at the correct answer to, to three or four decimal places. Easily good enough for an engineering, for engineering applications. And there's the Python commentary. Okay. And so I said, we're gonna go a little bit over an hour and we've just, we've just done that. Um, lecture today, Reviewed integration, it's a really useful tool. Um, we've seen a couple of applications of integration and you'll probably see a couple more in next week's lab sheet. Next lecture, Thursday, we're actually gonna use numerical integration to compute some probabilities. And you might think, what on earth has numerical integration got to do with computing probabilities? I'll leave that hanging as a uh, teaser. Um, we're gonna do exactly that on Thursday's lecture and introducing some different ways of some different random variables some different random number generators. We're gonna set ourselves up for some of the content to follow in the next couple of weeks of, of, of lectures. But I'll use that as just a little, a little um, encouragement 
for Thursday's lecture where we're actually, we're not giving up yet on integration. It's a really useful, um, powerful tool. And we're gonna use it to compute some probabilities with some random numbers. So uh, a reminder that Assessed Lab 2 runs this week in the face-to-face -face lab sessions. That means a couple of things. That means that there's no worksheet for this week's labs. The intention is that you attend your scheduled lab session. Uh, if there is some reason why you can't attend your scheduled lab session this week, I strongly encourage you to attend another lab session, but wherever possible, I'm asking demonstrators to check that, um, that you're in your scheduled lab session. I don't want all, this, all the students in the week doing their assessed labs as late in the week as they can, as they can make them. The intention is that you get your lab done um, in your scheduled lab session this week. Uh, there's a small number of students in the class who are completing the content online. You'll complete in your Zoom labs. And what that means is that this week, with the exception of the online students, and with the exception of a small subset of the Zoom labs, for most of you, there are no Zoom labs this week. So to be absolutely clear, Unless you're an online student or a student that's got um, that's been approved for for um, for a, an online uh, assessed lab, what you do this week is you attend your scheduled lab session, you complete the assessed lab, practice lab for you in week eight on Blackboard. You att att attend your assessed lab. You're assessed on the spot by your demonstrator. Um, and there's no Zoom lab this week. And we'll pick up next week in week 10 with our face-to-face -face and Zoom labs. So there will probably be questions. I think the best place to answer those questions is in, in Discord. I'll be sending out a couple of announcements in Blackboard and email uh, shortly in order to keep the, the class totally informed. But until we catch up on Thursday, I wish you good luck in your assessed lab this week. And I'll see you again on Thursday. Bye for now.